month. How many months? Uh, same summary as last time, just a reminder, there is a homework one assigned uh, and it's going to be due next Friday by 10 a.m. Uh, through D2L, you know the rules, uh, collaboration is encouraged, use blog for questions and comments. Um, let's uh, move on. All right, so since we lost um, annotations from the portion, well, from, uh, from last lecture, uh, I thought I should really go back to this loop gain calculation again uh, because it's more generally important. We may be, you know, we will be using the loop gain concept throughout. So here is a summary slide of what uh, is involved in, in finding the loop gain. Uh, the first point to note here is to identify where the feedback loop is. And that, in this case, is very simple. Uh, when you identify the feedback loop, you also want to identify the direction of signal propagating through that loop. When you have op-amp type circuitry, the direction is obviously from input of the op-amp to the output of the op-amp, so there's very little doubt about, uh, about that direction. But that is an item to, to keep in mind when you look at the feedback system. Yes? Can you raise the volume? I can't hear you. All right. They can hear me again. Guys, can you raise the volume there? Can you check it now? Yeah. Uh, let's try now. It's better. Okay. Yeah. I can hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'll try to shout a little bit. It's kind of hard to think about it. Uh, so first step in finding the loop gain is identify the, uh, the feedback loop and direction of signal propagation through the feedback loop check uh, that that feedback loop is negative. Okay, we've already done that for this example. Let's move on. Then we insert a test source. That's important. The test source here is V sub Z. That test source is inserted in series with the loop. And then there is one other important factor here that I think I missed to, to emphasize last time is that the placement of that test source is not entirely arbitrary. The test source should be placed at a node that behaves as an ideal voltage source. In op-amp circuitry, there is always such a convenient point because the output of the op-amp is represented by this uh, voltage-controlled voltage source. And so that node at the output of the voltage control voltage source is always a convenient point for insertion of this test source, the test uh, source V sub Z. Okay? Zero all other independent uh, signal sources. In this case here, that would be setting the input to zero. And then <coughs> find the response around the loop and we define that response as T is Vy over Vx. And you see the meaning of that response is really the total gain the signal experiences as it travels around the signal path through the entire loop. That's the meaning of the loop gain. And so we did this uh, calculation last time, and we found the loop gain here is, is very simple. It's equal to this voltage divider, R1 over R1 plus R2, times a naught. That was the loop gain we found for this particular example. So it's just a summary of what we did last time, so we have it recorded in, on, the, on the slide. Um, then we looked at a little more complicated example that includes now a, an op-amp circuit that is uh, you know, closer to uh, a practical circuit, so it has and non-zero output resistance, it has um, uh, not infinite input resistance, and it has some finite gain, uh, A naught. Uh, and the way you approach analysis of feedback circuits is, is, is the following. You know, you first, you identify ideal closed loop um, you know, gain. So that ideal closed loop gain, uh, in this case here, uh, will again be equal to just negative R2 over R1. That gain is uh, uh, it's 
output voltage over input voltage under the condition that A0 is infinity, right? Which A0 going to infinity is the same as saying as the loop gain uh, goes to infinity as well, because loop gain is directly proportional uh, to A0. Then you find the loop gain, and we'll do the same approach as in the previous slide. I'll insert a test source right here. Here is Vz. This is what we did last time. Here is Vx minus Vy. And you go around the loop, and you find out that the loop gain in this case is going to be a little different voltage divider. It's going to be R in parallel R1 over R in parallel R1 plus R2 plus R out and then times A0, okay? That's our loop gain. It's almost by inspection. You can just trace uh, the propagations of the signal around uh, the feedback loop here and find the loop gain. And then based on this, uh, you know, very first simple example, uh, we uh, concluded that there is a structure to the feedback uh, circuit response that we can reuse. There is a more general result uh, that is very useful because it allows us to, to, to uh, find closed-loop responses of feedback circuits very quickly. And that closed-loop response uh, we wrote in the form of a closed-loop ideal times the ratio of t over 1 plus t. Okay. This was the, the, the last statement I made in the lecture last time, and we said, well, this obviously is a lot simpler than going through the, uh, the brute force circuit solution, writing nodal equations and solving systems of equations. Uh, identification of the ideal closed loop gain is by inspection. Identification of the loop gain is almost by inspection. In many cases, it is really by inspection. And you have the form of the result, which is also in a very nice form, because it tells you and what exactly is the effect of, you know, having a finite loop gain on the, if you wish, the quality of your response? How close to the ideal response you are is entirely determined by the loop gain itself. Okay. I did ask you last time to actually look at this example and try to practice your circuit analysis skills and, in fact, try to do an exact solution without relying on this, uh, this formula right here. And uh, I think some of you actually did it, and I thank you very much. I think it was a you know, good blog questions and a couple of really good blog comments. Uh, good work. I thank, thanks to those who participated in that. What you found out uh, when you do an exact circuit analysis is that the actual response in this circuit, V out over V input, is not exactly this uh, part right here. There's something else going on here. So you find that a closed loop can be written in a form that in front has this nice closed loop ideal times t over 1 plus t form, but then it has some other stuff, okay? Uh, the loop gain itself is fine. We, are, we found it, uh, you know, okay, no change to it. So finding loop gain is perfect. There's no errors in it. But there is something in a closed loop obtained by exact circuit analysis not, not quite following this simple expression that we had, uh, that we proposed as a general uh, expression for feedback circuits. What's going on here? Why do we have uh, this part right here? And why, why is this really not working out fully? Um, the, this expression right here, uh, for those of you who have taken any you know, control area plus, you will probably recognize it. You know, this is the, the type of an expression that you have in, in a classical control system where everything is represented by block diagrams and where, um, you know, even without mention, there is an implicit assumption that propagation of signal through the, the blocks is unidirectional. Uh, circuits are not like that, right? And so when you look at this circuit here, we said, well, you know, here's the feedback path. You know, that feedback path, you know, in this case here goes like here, right? This is the feedback path, and we say, all right, what is the direction of the signal propagation through that feedback path? And we say, well, clearly this, right? Because that's how it, the signal goes through the op-amp. But when you look at input voltage 
to output voltage signal propagation, it's actually more complex than that. There is an alternative signal path that goes directly from input through R2 to the output. This signal path is not captured in this result right here. So the effect of that signal path, which is called direct transmission through the feedback circuit, uh, is what uh, is responsible for this uh, term right here. So this is direct transmission through feedback circuit and uh, that is responsible for this additional term that we have that deviates from the nice uh, relatively simple expression that we propose first as a general result for feedback circuits. All right, I'll show you in a moment how to find this direct transmission here also by inspection. Uh, but before we do that, let's uh, take a look at it for a second and see whether it is a significant factor or not. Uh, what do you think? It, well, you know, it, you can't really say no flat uh, because it really depends, okay? It depends on how large the loop gain is. The larger loop gain is this factor here of direct transmission of signal through these resistors to the output, even if you had no op amp whatsoever, that would be attenuated heavily by the presence of the feedback and more heavily so if the loop gain is larger, right? So the larger the loop gain is, the effects of this direct transmission through feedback uh, circuit uh, are relatively speaking smaller. Now practically speaking, you can also see that uh, the, the direct transmission is going to depend on how large the, um, the uh, output resistance of the op-amp actually is. So if the, the op-amp had very large output resistance, and you will see some of our circuit designs will in fact have large output resistance, then the effect of the direct transmission is larger. Okay. Uh, Again, in practice, in most cases, you could uh, neglect this part here, but it's good to be aware of the fact that this is not necessarily a complete and full general result uh, for all possible cases in, in feedback circuits. Uh, to elaborate on this uh, factor here just a, a little bit, uh, I would like to mention that there is actually a more general result uh, It's called Millbrook's feedback theorem. I'll just state it here. We are going to maybe use it, but without proof. That basically says that uh, a closed loop can be written in general as a closed loop ideal times T over one plus T plus this a direct transmission through the feedback path times one over one plus D, one plus T. And then the last point to this is to define how this term uh, that's called direct transmission through feedback path uh, is actually computed. That term right here can be computed in a very simple manner as V out over V input under the condition that the gain of the op amp is shut down, that the op amp is no longer active at all. So that's under the condition that A naught is set to zero. Okay, so this is a, a, a quick summary of what is really a general uh, feedback circuit analysis result. In most cases, the front part of it this part right here is the one that's really uh, dominant and, and is the most important one, but there can be real circuit examples where the, the direct transmission does make a difference. Comments, questions? Um, 
let's uh, actually do this calculation here for the circuit uh, at hand. Let's uh, find out this uh, ADF thing. So ADF is V out over V input when A naught is set to zero. What that really means is that this is now shorted. The op amp is really shut down. No active op amp. It's basically saying what the circuit passively by itself would be transmitting to the output if there is no active component uh, in it whatsoever. How do you solve this? Well, it is really it by inspection, but let me just redraw it so that you can see that it is a by inspection type thing. Here is what the circuit looks like. This is R out. This is R2, R1, R in. Okay, circuits one type circuit. How do you solve this? You can solve this in any number of ways. I'm going to show you how you should be solving this, right? Or one way of to solve this. Take these two, make a quick Thevenin equivalent. So this is going to be uh, V input, R in, over R1 plus R in, okay? That's now driving a circuit that has R in parallel R1. R2 and R out, and you have V out right here. And then this result right here is by inspection. Okay? It's R in over R1 plus R in times the voltage divider R out over R in parallel R1 plus R2, plus R out. That is ADF. <coughs> okay, just one quick example on the side of uh, how I would like you to be solving circuits. Um, there will be, I think, two or three occasions in the entire class where we need to write systems of equations. Uh, normally, you don't. Uh, I would like you to be able to write these things by inspection. Okay. And this is very elementary stuff, but let's go in that direction right up front. Okay, going back to our result right here. Here it is, and you can check, indeed, this part right here is this ADF. That's what we <coughs> The whole thing can be written, in fact, by inspection. And for those of you who were... Um, diligent enough uh, to do or try out brute force circuit solution, uh, you may say how much time you spent on that. Some effort, right? Uh, so we don't want to do that. We don't want to spend effort in circuit solution. We want to spend effort in the insight of what a circuit should be doing and how we should design it. Questions, comments? I spent a little too much time on this, but maybe okay. Can you go back to the next slide for a moment? Uh, other direction. Uh, one more. Thank you. <coughs> Let's hope the PowerPoint doesn't crash, so we're going to keep this. worth a minute, I think. Save it. Save it. I saved it. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on, though. We do have to cover quite a bit of stuff today. All right. The next uh, uh, you know, couple of bullets we want to talk about here is, is the fact that op-amp is, is not ideal for other reasons. And uh, those other reasons, uh, you know, one main you know, good or, or uh, important reason to keep in mind is that uh, it can only operate over a certain voltage range. That voltage range is determined by 
the supply voltages. And so what happens when you look at the large signal static transfer characteristic of an op-amp, what you would see is something that looks like this. So what we have right here is the differential input voltage. And what we have uh, on the vertical axis is the output. All right, so how output depends on the, the difference between the plus and minus inputs. And so what we see there is that, of course, for small differences in the input, right, these are tiny differences in the input, we see this really steep characteristic. The slope of that characteristic is going to be equal to A naught. That's our open loop gain. What are the values we are actually talking about in terms of open loop gain? What is realistically feasible in terms of open loop gain? What do you think? What is the order of magnitude of this A naught? If you pick just some cheap commercial op amp, what are the numbers that we see there? Close to six. Ten thousand. 60 dB, very large numbers, you know, at least thousands, in many cases tens of thousands, <laughs> hundreds of thousands, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth is fairly easily uh, available. So let's say 10 to the fourth, 10 to the sixth, very easily available. We'll get to the point of deciding how actually do we get this enormous amount of gains. You know, this is really interesting uh, how to actually get there, but it's, that's entirely possible. So this is really, really s steep. <laughs> But of course, it's steep only up to the, what the circuit is capable of doing. There is no way the output can possibly be greater than the positive supply voltage or less than the negative supply voltage. No question, right? In fact, in most cases, those out, you know, output voltage limits are more restrictive than the VDD and minus VSS. So the range of output voltages that are achievable on the, you know, the output of the op-amp is called the output voltage swing. So output voltage swing is an important characteristic. Uh, and that output voltage swing is really is, is defined by <coughs> the range of voltages where the OPM does have the steep characteristic with large amount of voltage gain. Why do you think this output voltage swing really matters? You know, who cares, right? Uh, how, uh, you know, whether, what is good? You know, it's good to have as wide output voltage swing as possible. But why? Why exactly? Well, you need to know the behavior of your device. I mean, for example, if it's an audio application, you need to know what are you driving in. Yeah, you need to know, well, you need to know what it is. You need to know how large the voltage can go up and down, right? But why? Why do we think of this as being something that's an important uh, characteristic to, to try to expand? What is the best we can do? The best we can do uh, is to have V out max, the maximum possible voltage of the output be approximately equal to VDD, uh, and the, the best uh, possible minimum voltage, of course, is approximately equal to minus VSS. You know, having these things here close to VDD and close to minus VSS. This, by the way, has, a, you know, if you have, if your circuit does have this characteristic, then it's called a rail to rail on the output side. This is a rail to rail op amp on the output side. Uh, that term is an important term. So it's a rail to rail output. You know, clearly where this term comes from is rail to rail, right? The positive, you know, negative supply rail to positive supply rail capability is a good, you know, it's a good characteristic. But still stepping back a, a little bit and discussing why exactly is this uh, a, a good characteristic. It, it becomes more and more important if the supply voltages available are smaller and small, you know, sh uh, smaller in magnitude. Uh, most typical examples would be mobile electronics. You know, you have your, uh, everything that you have in a pocket right now is supplied from a single cell lithium type battery, which is three point something volts. Okay, that's a typical value. Then it's usually stepped down to something like 2.5 volts to have a, a well-regulated voltage regardless of the battery state of charge. 
and everything is supplied from, you know, analog circuitry is very typically supplied from 0 to 2.5 volt. So we have an example here on the side. Uh, VDD uh, is maybe plus 2.5 volts and VSS is equal to 0. That's a single supply voltage. This is a relatively small voltage range available, okay? Now imagine for a second that your output voltage swing was one volt away from VDD and one volt away from minus VSS. So that means your signal, you know, would be actually constrained to 2.5 volts minus one. That would be at most 1.5 volts and then zero plus one, uh, that would be one volt. All your analog signals must be uh, in uh, 1 to 1 1.5 volt range. That's bad. Okay. It's bad because the smaller the signals you have, the less uh, signal to noise ratio you have, and less capability you have of driving outputs, for example, speakers uh, and so on. Right. So to extend the signal range available, it is desirable to exploit the most of the available supply voltage, and that becomes particularly or more and more important uh, for electronics that operates, and that's nowadays very commonly the case from very low supply voltages. Okay, so that's really the reason of why output voltage swing is an important quantity. Uh, you would like to have rail-to-rail -rail, uh, output capability. And we'll discuss that as we move on of, you know, how we actually design the circuits. You will see this is actually not so easy to do. Uh, and, and there are trade-offs in the process of designing uh, rail-to-rail type uh, uh, circuitry. Make sense? Okay. Another application example, we're going to do an analog integrator here. Uh, you will see where this example is going in just a moment. But first off, uh, I'm going to use this example also to talk about the frequency responses for a second. Uh, I'm going to assume here on a side uh, that V output is inside the output uh, voltage range, right? So this is right. So assume that output voltage is within the output voltage swing. Uh, which really means that A0 is very large. Okay? And that really means that we can say that uh, V out over V input is approximately uh, A closed loop of S. Oops. Ideal, and that in this case here is minus one over SCR. Right now we have a frequency response. It's no longer just a, a gain; it's a frequency response. And that frequency response, if you plot the magnitude of that response, it would look like this. This is F. This is 20 log magnitude A closed loop. That's in dB you would get a straight line, minus 20 dB per decade slope. We'll get to discussing frequency responses in a lot more detail later on. This is just a hint that you need to refresh your memory and skills in you know, doing frequency responses and plotting magnitude and phase responses, up, upfront warning. Um, all right, so now the, let's suppose the gain is not, um, um, you know, infinite, um, but let's say still keep, um, <coughs> keep output, uh, output resistance is relatively small, right? So let's say finite uh, A naught, some other color, finite A naught, <coughs> but we'll say R out is approximately zero, right? So then what do we have then? A closed loop 
of s in that case is going to be this ideal thing, you know, minus 1 over s c r times t over 1 plus t. What is uh, t in this case? A, a not uh, 1 over SC times R1 and... Right. It's again a divider, but it's now a divider of R over R plus 1 over SC, right? So that's going to be A not SCR 1 plus SCR, okay? <coughs> that's your loop gain, right? If you plug that back into here, how is that going to affect the uh, the shape of the magnitude response we have right here? What do you think? So you, you have two paths here. One is to just do a quick algebra and figure out what happens. Do it. Um, but the other path is just, let's just think about it. What could possibly happen if the gain were actually finite? What happens at very low frequencies in this circuit right here? There is no feedback. There is no feedback. C is open circuit. Really, you're applying V input to the minus input of the op amp, and that's the output. The output over the input at very low frequencies is simply going to be equal to A naught of the amplifier itself. I says, really, that's really all that happens. With a finite value of A naught, all we have is the finite gain at low frequencies. This is 20 log magnitude of A naught. That's it. That's the only difference we have. Uh, you know, and the rest is very much the same as we have for a uh, high loop gain. Okay, so that's what happens, right? Uh, so this is a quick example of having something that it does have frequency responses and, uh, you know, it serves as, uh, as an integrator, right? Very often you actually do want to have an integration type capability in, in analog uh, circuitry. Now, let's see what actually happens uh, right here. If you, um, I'm going to do an experiment uh, here of setting the input to zero and I'm going to flip the power to this uh, circuit on. Um, the question I have for you is, what is V out going to be? So, right, flip power on. Everything was discharged. Uh, the capacitor voltage was zero to start with. Flip the power on. There is no input voltage. This is tied to ground. And the, the question is, what is V output? What should V output be? Noise power of the R. What's that? Integration of the noise power coming from R. Integration of the noise power coming from R. Well, noise power is, uh, you know, is an AC signal. So if there is an integration of that AC signal, you'll see maybe a little bit of AC signal at the output. But, you know, uh, if you put a scope probe right there, it's probably going to be really hard to see that. Do we have VDDM minus VSS? Well, of course. We do have supply voltages applied, yes. We also maybe it's not zero at all. I mean, it's not. Maybe it's zero, and maybe it's not. I mean, right. that's a, that's a good answer. Actually, I have no idea what the output voltage is going to be, and neither you do, neither anyone else, really. Uh, we don't know. The, the output is most likely not going to be equal to zero. Very, very likely, or very, you know, very rarely, would actually be equal to zero. So, not equal to zero, um, and the reason that it's not going to be equal to zero is what is called an offset, right? So. Offset is uh, really the next thing that we want to discuss. Uh, offset is a, is a property of, of an op amp, but it is a very, you know, it's a property that you probably haven't seen uh, before. It has interesting characteristics. Uh, so the output, uh, likely, the output is going to be close to plus VDD 
or close to minus VSS. And that's because this guy here has very large gain and tiny little bit of offset on the input side produces the output. The output is just going to saturate. Now, on a side practical note related to this is that the, the integrator as shown right here is not a practical circuit. It doesn't work by itself, right? So the, if you want to build an integrator and you say, well, I was going to put this capacitor or resistor around an op amp, that's actually not going to work because the output is going to be very likely saturated at the output to either positive supply voltage, negative supply voltage. It doesn't work at all. Uh, there is no transfer functions to it. The output is stuck at one of the supply rails. And the reason behind it is, is offset. Integrator of this type can be used as, a, as an effective circuit, but it has to be part of some other feedback around that prevents the output from saturating to one of the supply, uh, supply rails. All right, so discussion about the, uh, what's called the input offset voltage is going to be done on this slide right here. So remember, we, we just said this is an ideal, uh, this is an, uh, uh, a, a transfer characteristic of an op amp from input differential voltage to output. You have this really steep slope going right through the, uh, the, the origin, and then you saturate when you, you reach, you know, close to the supply rails. In reality, unfortunately, this characteristic is shifted one way or another around the origin, and the real characteristic of the op amp actually looks like something like this. The same thing right here, same slope, same gain, and same saturation points, but the crossing of the zero is offset with respect to the ideal zero point. This here is what we called uh, what we call V offset. That's the input offset voltage. All right. Now, if this, well, first of all, why do we have this? There's a million reasons we have that. In fact, we'll actually discuss them in some detail when you see how the actual circuitry looks like. But in, in short, input offset voltage is, is, is a result of mismatches in the internal circuitry of the op amp between the plus and minus side. Ideally, those circuits on the plus and minus sides are exactly the same, ideally matched, but that's impossible. You cannot possibly have something that's exactly the same on two sides. And because of that slight mismatch between the circuitry on the minus side and the plus side of the op amp, the resulting characteristic has a built-in offset to it. Yes. So is the offset something that's going to be unique to each device that you get, or should it be unique to the design itself? So do you have to test for it if it's going to be <coughs> something sensitive in your design? Oh, I plan to talk about what it is in, in the next, next one. So what, you know, the, the key point to understand about the offset is that it is a random quantity. It is different from one device to another. You know, you have one chip done at this particular location on a, on a, on a silicon die, the next one is right next to it, Ex exactly the same circuit design. Everything is perfectly the same, yet they're slightly different. Right? These mismatches are random quantities uh, that are impossible to control, and as a result, we talk about the offset as being, importantly, a random quantity. We cannot tell whether offset is plus 3 millivolts or minus 4 millivolts. All we can talk about is how, it, how that offset voltage is going to be distributed. And so here you have an example of, uh, you know, distribution of the offset voltage. That was done by measuring many, many, many devices. You, know, you actually can measure fairly easily offset on a device, and you measure that, so, you know, some devices have offset of 0.9 millivolts, some devices have offset of 0.5 millivolts, some have, you know, 0.1 milli millivolts, and so on. And, and you put a histogram together that shows how this offset is distributed, and then the characteristics that you put in, in your data sheet include uh, what is um, called a typical value, uh, so that you can say that V offset is less than or equal to this typical value of 0.5 millivolts, or greater than uh, you know, 0.5 millivolts, for a certain percentage of the devices. 
typically, where they say this typical value here, that typically refers to 85% uh, of devices. Okay. And so you can say that it's very likely the offset is going to be between minus 0.5 millivolts and 0.5 millivolts. Okay. But there can be devices that have offset that's larger than that. And, and then there's also a, a, sometimes, you know, depending on the data sheet, you would see what would be called the worst case value. So this, the max value here uh, would be the worst case. And so you would say the offset is somewhere between minus 3 millivolts and plus 3 millivolts, worst case. They will see later on when you get homework assignments and you say, well, you know, what's the worst case? Something that means we are going to use the worst case value, uh, for example, for the offset. Uh, again, importantly, we don't know what the polarity of the offset actually is, but we have some statistics that tells us what the characteristics of that offset may actually be. What are the typical values that we see in, in uh, modern op-amp designs? Uh, typical values range from uh, very small values, well, relatively small values, in the order of, uh, let's say, 0.1 milli, uh, millivolt typical uh, for uh, bipolar junction type uh, transistor offsets to maybe a few millivolts uh, typical for uh, um, op amps that are based on MOS devices. So MOSFETs are not as good in terms of matching characteristics compared to the bipolar transistors. Okay, so going back to now how to actually include this offset in our circuit analysis, uh, a simple way to include um, an, an offset is to actually place explicitly a voltage source equal to V offset in front of one of the, the inputs of the, the op-amp. So uh, this is along the lines of modeling op-amp more realistically. So if you have an op-amp on a side here, this is a real component, right? This is a symbol for the real component. You model that component as a component that has zero offset inside, and then you explicitly pull out the voltage of V offset in front, so you can circuit-wise evaluate the effect of the offset on, on your application. Let's stop here for a second and see if this actually makes sense. You know, go back to uh, you know, the way we said the actual characteristics look like. Right? So you see, offset is really representing the shift with respect to the point in the characteristic where you have this steep slope passing through zero. So if you wanted to get uh, zero volts in the output right here, what should the input be? What input would give the output equal to zero? V offset. v offset, right? So if you actually had an input voltage right here, that input voltage equal to V offset, that would give V output equal to zero. This is, in fact, exactly the same as the shift in the characteristic we have already talked about. So very easy, simple, and effective way to model offset is to place this source up front in front of one of the inputs of the op-amp. Whether you place it in front of the, uh, the, the plus input or the minus input makes no difference because we already know that we have no idea what the sign of V offset actually is. But if you flip this V offset this way or that way, also makes no difference, right? This is uh, entirely arbitrary. Uh, you have to keep in mind that V offset polarity is not known in advance, right? It can be either way. All right, so let's uh, go back and revisit our, uh, our integrator right here and place uh, V offset right now. And then we can actually explain, you know, why the output voltage is going to be uh, likely going to positive supply voltage or negative supply voltage. Uh, let's suppose V input is equal to zero here for a second. So we shut this one guy down. But now our model actually does include V offset. 
and you see, you know, let's suppose this one has, in fact, very large gain. If it has very large gain, that means the B of plus and B of minus, as long as the feedback exists, are the same. And so you will have V offset voltage present at this point right here. This is going to be V offset. As a result of that V offset, there's going to be current V offset over R flowing through that resistor R. That current has no other place to flow but through the capacitor, so that current is going to be V offset over R. And if initially, when you flip the switch, the capacitor voltage initially, Vc of zero were equal to zero, you see that the output voltage is in fact going to be equal to V offset uh, plus uh, v, you know, uh, v offset over R, that's the current over C times time. The output voltage as a function of time is going to ramp up or ramp down depending on the polarity of the, uh, of the offset voltage, and that ultimately is going to go to either plus, you know, close to plus VDD or close to negative uh, VSS depending on what. Well, how do we, you know, what's going to decide whether this goes to positive VDD or negative ESS? Polarity of, polarity, of, of polarity of offset, right, on the polarity of... All right. <coughs> That's that. Um, once the output voltage hits one of these limits, the output is going to get stuck there. There's nothing to return it back. That, that's the end of it. Can we fix this? Yes. How? <coughs> what do you say? What? How would you fix this, right? You know, this, this, you know, stupid voltage offset inside, it makes the whole thing doesn't work well, what can we do to uh, counteract uh, this in some way? Can we do a circuit design that counteracts it? <coughs> what could you possibly... You add in a voltage source um, in series with VOS, that's negative VOS? Yeah, sure. You can say, hey, you know, maybe I can be smart here. You know, take this off from ground and put this to some, uh, you know, voltage divider right here. Let's say this is plus VDD. You know, this is minus VSS. And I'm just going to tweak this and just cancel out V offset. Cancel V offset. Right, so in principle, it's possible to do this, right? What do you think about that approach? A lot of thermal dependency. There are all kinds of problems with this approach. One, appro one problem is that there are, there are thermal effects here. You know, the offset actu voltage actually changes with temperature. So, and, you know, the, you know you, you, let's assume you're actually very skilled and you have this multi-turn potentiometer here and you, you spend your afternoon and tweak it just right. And everything is great. And then you go, you know, drink your coffee and come back, and the output is again saturated, right? The things have changed. So the, the tweaking in the, of this sort here is compromised by, number one is compromised is temperature effects. But even if there were no temperature effects, how effective is this technique? You know, let's suppose you want to make uh, 100 million uh, iPad, you know, iPad uh, 5s, right? And for each one of these, you have to have some guy tweaking <laughs> the circuit here for every op amp inside um, <laughs> to, to cancel the offset. Well, it makes no sense, obviously, right? This tweaking idea is absolute nonsense, right? There's no way this can possibly be done in reality. You can maybe do it in your hobby circuit once, and you realize, well, maybe I could fix it and just show to my professor things work, and then things don't work anymore, but who cares? But, but in reality, this is not a way to, to fix the offset, right? So no easy way to actually fix offset problems. You have to work with them. You, know, you have to uh, admit the offset does exist and, and then uh, work with the, the offset present. Although I should say uh, there are no easy ways, but there are a little more, more smart, you know, smarter ways to do it. There are ways to construct 
circuits that can actually online learn what the offset is and cancel it electronically. Uh, those circuits are based on switch capacitor techniques. That's very interesting. Uh, we may, if we have some time at, towards the end of the class, we'll mention some of those. But the idea is to actually not tweak this, but in fact have the circuit self-correct itself and do that by learning what the offset is and canceling it out uh, electronically. That's actually possible to do. There are smart ways to do that. All right. Um, maybe one minute. There is more stuff to talk about. There is uh, a, you know, so I'm going to, you know, I'm talking, talking about these things one at a time. You know, in the end, we're going to have a model that includes everything. But right now, uh, we are exposing another effect of non-ideality that's related to the input bias currents, right? Uh, input bias currents are uh, a result of the fact that there is a need to bias the input circuitry inside the op-amp, and those input bias currents are modeled by uh, having these two current sources present on the two input nodes of the, of the op-amp. So when you look externally, you will see that, you know, the currents flowing into the input um, uh, pins of the op-amp are not equal to zero. And these input bias currents are present, uh, you know, they're biasing uh, internal devices. Uh, biasing of op-amp internal circuitry. The, the, the order of magnitude of these guys here depend on the technology used to, to make the device. Uh, they're in the order of, let's say, uh, microamps uh, for BJT type circuits, and maybe in the order of, uh, let's say, picoamps, very small for uh, MOS type uh, circuits, right? You, know, you can think of that as really being base, base bias currents for BJTs, and or the gates of the, the MOSFETs, some very tiny leakage currents. So these, these currents are normally not uh, uh, super important, and in, in most cases they can be safely neglected, but they are present and they may make an effect in a, in a more advanced design. Uh, so we'll do a couple of examples with um, the input bias current, and then we'll mention that there is an offset between the two as well, which is, again, a random quantity. All right, so have a good uh, long weekend, and I'll see you next uh, Wednesday. Thank you.